Everyone else, if you have your Bible, grab a bulletin on the way in, at least have your phone turn, open or click. We find ourselves this morning back in the book of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4 is where we will uh, begin this morning. Uh, remind you of uh, one of the verses that we ended with in the sermon last week. Uh, if we were going at a slightly slower pace through uh, Hebrews, I would have preached an entire sermon uh, on that uh, Bible memory verse, probably for many of us, that his word is living uh, and active. And I just want to remind you uh, that that's the attitude that we take as we come before the reading and the preaching of God's word, that it is living and active. We don't see the Bible just as a book for us to read. It is a book that reads uh, us. And that is my prayer uh, for us this morning as we continue to, uh, to get into some really good stuff here in Hebrews. Let me uh, let me pray for us, and then we will read and preach through this passage. And Father, we uh, thank you again. Thank you for the fresh reminders of your grace and your mercy poured out uh, to us through uh, the sacrifice of Jesus uh, Christ. Give us your mind. Give us your uh, heart this morning. Help us really and truly to fix the eyes of our heart upon you uh, this morning, upon your word. Uh, would your word get a hold of us? Let this book read uh, us. And we pray it in the authority of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 14, going to chapter 5, verse 10. You hear God's word. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he's obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself but only when called by God just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You're my son. Today I have begotten you. And he says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Amen. Amen. Um, you can see... If you have your bulletin in front of you, it's, here it is on the uh, slide. The title of the sermon this morning, The Heart of Christ. The Heart of Christ. I am uh, borrowing the title of the sermon from the book that I had referenced in the beginning of the service, that uh, Puritan book written in the 1600s, actually on Hebrews 4.15, The Heart of Christ. Uh, the Heart of Christ. Uh, what I want to do in the, the sermon this morning is uh, share uh, with, uh, with you all something that has been, uh, at least for me, in, uh, in my life until maybe some very recent years, uh, if not a missing piece of the gospel, uh, certainly a neglected piece uh, of the gospel. And it is uh, a heart uh, level understanding of the heart of Christ. Uh, this is a pretty big goal uh, for the sermon uh, this morning to get into not only our minds, but to get into our hearts, the heart uh, of Christ. Now, uh, how many of you, true confession time, are uh, actually keeping up with the Bible uh, reading plan? I'm going to talk to the 
Wow, good job. If I'm going to talk to the 20 or 30 of you who just put your hand up. Maybe there was more than that. Uh, you read this morning Psalm 132. I just read it uh, this morning. Uh, Psalm 132 verse 13 says, uh, For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his uh, dwelling place. That God has desired. Some of you are shaking. That's what I read this morning. Did you not read Psalm 132? I'm on the extra, the, uh, the illustrations are already lost. Go home and read Psalm 132, verse 13. <laughs> Psalm 132 in the ex, extra extended Bible reading plan, apparently, that I am uh, doing. Uh, it says that God desired Zion, that he desired uh, us. Uh, that word desire is a very strong uh, word in the Hebrew language. It means, uh, in some uh, context, that same word is used to, uh, to uh, connote uh, someone's longing, that they long for it. Actually, in some context, that same word is used for lust. No, that's not what Psalm 132 is about at all, but it is this strong longing or this strong desire that God has uh, for his people. And that's what we're after uh, this morning, is to understand uh, Jesus' heart, his desire, even his longing uh, for us, for his, uh, for his people. Um, see, and I, I think the problem is this. We, we can often uh, project a very human uh, kind of thinking onto our relationship uh, with God in such a way that most of us, as you sit here in the room this morning uh, in Christ, you put your faith in him, very few of us question, I think, the love of God uh, for us, right? We, we understand that God loves us. That's the plainest and clearest declaration of the gospel, isn't it? It's one of the first Bible verses we learn for God so loved the world, John 3, 16, uh, that he, you know, for God so loved the world, he, he gave his one and only son. We understand that God, uh, that, that God loves the world, even that he loves me, right? The apostle Paul would take that a step further in Galatians 2 and say, uh, Jesus loves me. He gave himself up for me. Uh, but, but I wonder, I, I wonder as we sit here, while we don't necessarily question God's love, I wonder, uh, do we secretly suspect in the back of our minds that maybe God doesn't like us uh, very much? Uh, that, that we understand that he loves us, uh, but are we really and truly really convinced that he likes us, that his heart is drawn uh, to us, that there is uh, delight uh, that he has uh, in his people, in, uh, in us. Um, and again, we have a very human and illogical way of thinking about some of these things. How many, how many of you have ever said something like, I love this, but I don't know if I like this? All right? That doesn't actually make sense, because I don't think you can love something and not like something, but in our minds, that's what we tell ourselves. I'm in the midst of um, marathon uh, training. And last Saturday, I was out on a, on a really long uh, run. And about mile 15, I hit the wall. I mean, things just were falling apart. Uh, I was dehydrated, not necessarily hallucinating, uh, but uh, not feeling very great uh, at all. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, I love running, but I don't know if I like running. <laughs> I love it, but I don't know if I like it. Maybe we, we've said things like that. We've thought things like that. Maybe we've said to someone, you know, I love you right now but I don't know if I like you right now. <laughs> uh, they can't go, the, 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 lo, to, if I love someone, I like them. The, uh, it's, I can't just have a duty-bound commitment to someone or something and not at the same time have a delight, have a heart that's drawn to that. They are meant to go together, yet in our twisted uh, human way of thinking, we separate them. And so while we can be convinced that God loves me, maybe we're not convinced that he likes me. We might picture uh, Jesus, uh, for instance, giving us uh, an embrace, giving us a hug, but uh, maybe some of us suspect that uh, before Jesus does that, he takes a breath and holds his nose and then gives us a hug. Right? Um, that I, I really, re really and truly, I think that, uh, that many of us in the, in the back of our minds, in the back of our hearts, we don't question whether or not God loves, God loves us, uh, but I wondered, uh, are we fully convinced uh, that he likes us, that his heart is drawn for us? And I am convinced that I'm not alone, that this is, if not a missing piece, certainly a neglected piece uh, of the gospel. Um, I'll remind you of those, um, that very famous scene in the beginning of, uh, well, at least Mark's gospel, Jesus' baptism. Uh, Jesus, baptized by his cousin uh, John, comes up out of the, uh, the River Jordan. Uh, something re remarkable happens, right? The heavens are torn open, the Spirit falls down on Jesus, and he hears his Father's voice. Uh, that's significant for us because, uh, at least in this context, what is said to Jesus is said to, said to us, those who are in Christ. And you remember what the Father says. He says, uh, you're my son, right? You're my son uh, whom I love, 
And I think many of us just stop there. You're, you're my son. I've, I've, you're, you're my daughter. You've got a place in the family whom I love. But that's not, the re that's not all that he says. The father says, you're my son whom I love. With you I am well what? Pleased. With you I'm well pleased. The, the father's heart is, is for his son. And he wants his son to know not only do I love you, but I like you. I delight in you. My heart overflows with goodness towards you. We need to get a hold of this. Um, I think that's what uh, the aim of the author of Hebrews is, uh, is doing in this passage. So what I want to do in the sermon this morning is defend a statement uh, made by Thomas Goodwin, Puritan in the 1600s, presented to us very clearly in this passage, and it is this, that in order for us to draw close to God, uh, in order for us to confidently draw near to the throne of grace as this passage calls us to do, we need to be first convinced in our heart of heart that Jesus' heart is for us. That we need to get a fuller and deeper heart level understanding of the heart of Jesus for us if we are to boldly and confidently move towards this throne of grace. Or maybe we could say it in the negative fashion that perhaps the reason we live such half-hearted, weak lives it's because we have not fully grasped the heart of Jesus Christ for us. We've not heard the words of the Father say, You are my son, you're my daughter, whom I love with you. I am well pleased. And so we're looking to Jesus this morning. This passage invites us to look to, look to Jesus. We're going to see three things. The person of Christ. Uh, number two, the heart of Christ. That's the, the meat of the sermon. And we'll finish with a word on the power of Christ. Uh, keeping in mind, we're, we're seeking to unpack that statement. If I am to draw close to God boldly and confidently, I need to first grasp the heart of Christ. So look with me in our passage. We begin back in verse 14. Our passage begins, since then, we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Our uh, author of Hebrews here calls us once again, not a surprise to you if you've been sitting here uh, most Sundays this fall, calling us to look to Jesus, calling us to, to consider uh, Jesus. Why this repeated emphasis uh, in this letter of looking to Jesus, considering Jesus, seeing him? It is because we are convinced that the center of Christianity is not primarily a set of doctrinal, uh, you know, propositions to believe. It's not primarily a way to live our lives. It's not primarily a way of kind of uh, entering uh, into the world. The Christianity certainly includes all those things. But at the center of Christianity, at the center of our faith, is a person, Jesus. It's not primarily a set of propositions. At the center is a person, right? That's what the author of Hebrews wants us to see when Jesus very famously in John 14 6 in the Gospels declares I am the way the truth and the life we understand that what he is saying is not I just it's, he's, he's not just saying I came to teach you truth he says I am the truth right I didn't just come to give you a way to live your life what he says is I am the way I didn't just come to uh, you know offer you life he says I am the life Christianity our faith it centers on a person on a person I happen to be uh, reading this week an autobiography the subtitle of it is a secular Jew comes to faith in uh, Christ this is a New York Times uh, column, col column journalist uh, who's chronicling chronicling it's going to be a long sermon uh, he's telling the story of how he came to Jesus and he said the turning point for him was when someone challenged him to understand Christianity not primarily as a set of principles but as centered on a person we need to see that it's not yes it includes principles yes it includes doctrine but it's about Jesus we're called to look to Jesus now here uh, in Hebrews as we look to Jesus uh, the author of Hebrews here uh, seems to want us to see two things in particular about the person of Christ. One emphasizes his divinity, that he is fully God, and the other, which is our primary focus this morning, would emphasize Jesus' humanity. He's fully man. So let's just briefly look at uh, these two things. Uh, the first thing that we see about Jesus in this passage is that he is he's God, he's fully God. Since then we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, uh, the Son of God. Jesus 
the Son of God. This is a very familiar phrase to us, but this is actually the first time in the letter of Hebrews that he has used this title to, a phrase in, in, in its exact wording anyway, to describe Jesus. A reminder to us that the Jesus of, um, that was born in that manger 2,000 years ago, Jesus of Nazareth is as well the Son of God, fully God, the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. He is God, always has been, always will be. And so we begin there, we necessarily begin there because the emphasis of this passage is not primarily on Jesus' divinity, but it is on his humanity. The second thing we see here is not just that Jesus is the Son of God, but here he is revealed to us as our great high priest, our great high priest. Uh, the, the, this, the idea of Jesus being our high priest is a function of his humanity. It's a function of the incarnation of Christ. And uh, here again in our study of Hebrews, we come to an image, we come to an idea uh, pulled from the Old Testament and fully aware that many of us maybe aren't uh, entirely familiar with the, the Old Testament. This would have been some point of familiarity for, his, uh, for the original audience. Uh, two important things we can say about the priest in the Old Testament. Two things that they did. Number one, they stood with the people. And number two, they interceded for the people. All right? Priest, uh, at the most basic level, what they did was stand with the people. And secondly, they interceded for the people to God. Uh, even if you've never opened the Old Testament before, this shouldn't be an entirely foreign concept uh, to us, right? Uh, I was thinking, um, isn't this kind of how a labor union uh, works today, isn't it? You get a group of employees together, they elect a, uh, a head, they elect a representative, someone from among them, they're going to stand with them, and they're going to represent their interest uh, to the company. That's, that's in very high-level uh, terms what a priest did in the Old Testament, what Jesus does for us. He stands with us uh, and he intercedes for us. Uh, look at how the author unpacks this in verse 15. Uh, we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. That Jesus, as our high priest, as one who stands with us. Jesus stands with us. He stands uh, among us uh, to such a way and to such an extent that he actually says he enters into the human condition, enters into humanity in such a way that he, the, this verse says he has been tempted with sin in every respect, in every respect as we are yet without sin. Jesus in taking on humanity, Jesus in taking on flesh understands what it is to be uh, human, what it is to be tempted with sin. Uh, there's, a, um, there's a current, uh, I think it's current, uh, uh, ad campaign uh, that I, I see <laughs> maybe every Sunday when I watch the Eagles game. Uh, the tagline is, he gets us. We see these, uh, it's some, some depiction of Jesus and it says he, he gets us. Uh, I know people like to criticize that. I'm not sure exactly why, but I think the punchline of that that is, is right on. That's, that's what Hebrews 4.15 is about here. That Jesus gets us. He understands what it is to be human. He understands what it is to be tempted. He understands what it means to be mistreated or misunderstood. Um, that book that I mentioned in the beginning of the service by uh, Dane Ortland, Gentle and Lowly, uh, in reflecting on this past and reflecting on this idea, says um, this, this represents Jesus' solidarity with us. He is in, in solidarity uh, with us, that he understands the pain and the suffering and the sin and what we go through. He is our priest who stands with us, not just someone who is standing at a distance. Very often, I think when we picture God, when we picture Jesus, we picture one who is standing at a distance with his arms folded. That is not the picture that is presented here in the passage. It is one who came down into our mess, who is in solidarity with us. Us. For some of you, maybe this is all that you need to hear this morning. Now, I'm not done the sermon, so that's a very foolish statement to make at this point. Uh, but maybe this is what you need to take <laughs> into your mind and into your heart and walk out that door with is to understand that Jesus understands what it is that you are going through. That's why he was made our high priest. He is in solidarity uh, with us. But of course, that's not the only function of the high priest. Again, not only does he stand uh, uh, with us, uh, Jesus 
Jesus intercedes for us. This was the function of the priest. Look at verse 1 of chapter 5 as we continue to follow our passage. For every priest chosen from among men uh, is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for uh, sin. So not only does a priest stand with the people, uh, most importantly, uh, he intercedes for that uh, group of people uh, to, to God, right? The priest uh, in the Old Testament, the priest uh, uh, Jesus in our passage here, uh, the the word would be mediator, that Jesus is a mediator, the priest is a mediator, one who stands between heaven and earth, interceding for the people, on behalf of the people, uh, to God. Uh, in the Old Testament, as our passage will go on to, to reflect on, in the Old Testament, that priest had to, had to intercede for himself because he had his own sin and he had his own messes that he had to, to deal with. Not so with Jesus, he enters fully into our mess, but he's perfect, he's clean, he doesn't need to make sacrifices first for his own sin and then for the the sins of the people. Um, and so as we look to Jesus, right, the first part of the sermon, the first part of what we're trying to get fixed into our head, we look to Jesus, we look to the person of Christ, one who stands with us, one who uh, intercedes for us. And I do need to call your attention to one other element of the, the priesthood of Jesus before we get into the heart of Jesus, which I think is the heart of this passage. Uh, we're not going to go too deep on this. I did put a discussion question in uh, for our life groups. If you uh, want to debate this in your life groups, uh, look with me at the last Last verse of our passage, uh, for the first time, uh, we see this mysterious figure of Melchizedek uh, appear here in Hebrews. This is not, uh, this is the first time uh, in this passage uh, that we see this, verse 6 and there in verse 10, won't be the last time. Uh, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Um, again, the author is going to return to Melchizedek uh, later. Melchizedek, whose name literally translated means king of righteousness, is one who uh, apparently was a king, one who was a priest. He appears in the Old Testament with very little explanation. He appears here with very little uh, explanation. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that we could take an entire sermon and preach on uh, Mel Melchizedek. Uh, the point here, what we'll try to restrain ourselves for, the point here would, would seem to, to remind us that yes, while Jesus is our priest, a function of his humanity at the same time, uh, there's something special about Jesus as our priest. He's not just entering in his humanity, he's entering into that priesthood in his divinity. Uh, and so that maybe is the point of calling your attention to Melchizedek. We're not going to get caught up with that. That's not the point of the sermon. Uh, so just big, big idea. We look to Jesus. We look to Jesus as the Son of God. We look to Jesus as our high priest. The primary focus of this passage Passage. The primary focus of the sermon, though, is wanting to understand the heart of Christ. Understand the heart of Christ. So we understand this through the lens of Jesus being the Son of God, Jesus being our high priest. Um, let me repeat what I began the sermon with just a few moments ago. That I believe that this is, if not a missing piece, it is certainly a neglected piece of the gospel. That we can understand the person of Christ. We can understand certain aspects of this, at least with our minds. But what we need to do, and I'm convinced that this is what we need to do uh, as a church cornerstone, is to understand at a heart level uh, the heart of Christ. The heart of Christ. What, what, how does his heart come through as Jesus, the Son of God, our high priest? And to begin to unpack this wonderful and glorious uh, thought, I want to, um, we're going to begin in verse 15, and I want to really just call your attention to one word, just one word, and it is that word sympathize. We do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Now, that word sympathy in the English language uh, certainly suffers from overuse. And because it suffers from overuse, it also suffers from misuse. We've lost uh, any kind of real understanding of what that word sympathy means. And interestingly, that word sympathy is a transliteration practically from the Greek. It is a Greek word. It's a compound word. The word sim means with, and pathy or pathos means feeling. And so what it literally means is with feeling. When we're told that Jesus is able to sympathize with us, what this passage is saying is Jesus is able to feel, follow me, feel what we feel. 
that Jesus, as our high priest, is able to feel what we feel. To so enter into our situation, individually and personally. So able to enter into our circumstance that not only does he see what we see, but he feels what we feel. When we sympathize with someone, we so come alongside them, not just to understand the pain that they're going through. If you really sympathize with someone, what that means is you feel. You come to feel and experience what they are feeling and experiencing. And again, because we have totally lost touch with what that word sympathy means, um, we we misuse that word all the time. Now, I love how the King James Version, this was a translation of the Bible back in the early 1600s, they understood what the word sympathy means. Uh, Listen to how the King James Version translates uh, this verse. We do not have an high priest. This is why we need a new translation. It is a little awkward (laughs) to our modern ears. Which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Right? That's, they understood what the word sympathy means. Uh, we don't have a high priest who has not been touched with the feeling of our infirmities, our sin, our uh, weakness. Um, and I, I know there is such an overemphasis in our day, in the cultural moment that we occupy on feelings. We don't know what to do with it. But the Bible talks about feelings here. That, uh, and that Jesus can feel what we feel. You know, think about this um, in, in, in human terms. How is it that we come to uh, sympathize with someone? How do, we, how, do we, uh, how, how do we come to feel what they feel? Not just see what they see, not just intellectually understand what they, what they understand, but to feel it. To feel it. Um, it's been uh, thir- 13 years since my, uh, since my father died. He, uh, he was 55. I was in my late 20s. And I will tell you, uh, this church did such a wonderful job of loving me, loving my family as we walked uh, through that. But I, I can tell you that the people from whom I received the greatest and deepest sympathy were those who had been there or had experienced death of some kind untimely, uh, you know, someone untimely taken away from them. Because I, I, I knew that they didn't just uh, intellectually uh, understand what I was going through, but they could feel what I feel. And that's what this passage is saying about Jesus. That he not just, not not only understands us, but he feels what we feel. And that's what this passage is saying. That Jesus has been there. That he has experienced what we experience. That he has felt what we feel. And that he can sympathize. Now, this, here's, here's the sermon. At what point in your life... Do you, uh, are you most likely to question, most likely to doubt Jesus' sympathy for you? When, 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 when are you most likely to, to think to yourselves, um, I know Jesus loves me, but I don't think he really likes me right now? At, at, what, point in, in, in your, at what point in your day, right, are, are you tempted to understand Jesus as, as maybe being willing to give you a hug, but first he needs to hold his, hold his, uh, you know, hold his nose? At what point? At what point? Isn't it this, right? It's in the midst of our weakness. It's in the midst of our weakness. It's when we have fallen down. When we most need it. That's the very moment where we most need it. But that's the very moment where we, where we question it. Let's pull the ESV back up. And see what this passage says. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. With our weakness. Understand that the weakness that this passage is referring to is not the frailty of the human condition. The context makes it abundantly clear. He's not talking about the frailty of the human condition. He's talking about the sinfulness of the human condition. That's why here in verse 15 he says he's been tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. It's not just that he can sympathize with the, our frailty. It's that he can sympathize with our, uh, our sinfulness. It's, it's, uh, I think it's verse 2 of chapter 5. It goes on to talk about the Old Testament priest being able to deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward. The ignorant and the wayward. Every commentator that I read this week said this, says this represents two classes of sins. It's intentional sins and unintentional sins. That sometimes we sin and we fall down just unintentionally. Just a product of the brokenness of, of our lives. The brokenness of the world around us. But then there's other times when you willfully sin. You know the good that you were supposed to do and you didn't do it. You know the evil that you weren't supposed to do. And that you ended up doing. 
And what this passage is saying is in the very midst of that sin, in the very midst of that time that I blew it again, when I, all I want to do with my flesh is run, and all I want to do is seek isolation, what is preached to us in this passage is not isolation, but solidarity. That he is able to feel what you feel, even in the midst of your sin. That's what this passage is declaring to us. That's the heart of Christ. It just flows out of his heart. He can't help it. And I'll tell you, this is something that makes the Pharisee, it makes the legalist quite uncomfortable. Because they think in order to evoke the sympathy of Jesus, they need to first beat themselves up. And church, we're not talking about minimizing sin here. But I'm talking about what you feel and what you experience in the midst of your sin, in the midst of messing up. And do you understand that Jesus' heart runs towards you? It is precisely in those moments of weakness that we need to grasp the heart of Christ. That will transform your battle against sin. That and that alone, perhaps. You know, oddly, I think we can understand this on a, um, on a human level, right? Isn't it, isn't it the weakness of others that just wells up compassion with, within us? Um, I have, over the past uh, couple of years, this year in particular, got involved with a, a high school uh, running uh, team. And uh, I'll tell you, there, there's one thing you should know about the sport of running, particularly if, you'll do it, if you do it competitively. It requires you to go all in, heart, soul, mind, body, just all in. And you show up on race day, and any number of things can uh, just throw you off course. You, you know, the weather was bad. You ate something bad for lunch. Somebody spiked your, uh, spiked your ankle. And, uh, so it's, it's not uncommon for me to be standing at the uh, finish line as these big, tough uh, teenage boys are coming across the finish line, having not run the race that they thought that they were going to run, and just be absolutely emotionally raw and done and spent. What do you do, right? What, 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 do, you, what do you do when you see a child, or you see a child, you know, whom you love, or depending on the relationship? What, what, do, you, what do you do when you see somebody struggling uh, like that? <laughs> Go take a shower and uh, get changed and then come back to me. That's not what you do at all, right? You run up and you grab their sweaty, smelly body and you wrap your arms around them and you tell them you love them. You tell them you're proud of them. Do you understand? That's what this passage is saying. That in the midst of our sin, that in the midst of failing it and blowing up, Jesus runs to us because he's able to sympathize. He's able to feel what we feel. And until we grasp that within our hearts, we will not be able to do what the passage calls us to do. And we'll finish with this verse 16, to with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Until we can understand the heart of Christ for sinners and sufferers, we will not be able to with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, it's interesting, last week, last chapter of the passage began with, let us fear, lest some should fail to have reached the promised land. Here he says the exact opposite. Not let us fear, but let us have confidence. Let us boldly enter uh, into God's presence. And what happened? What happened between last week's passage and this week's passage? Jesus happened, right? He called us to look to Jesus, to see him, to see his open arms, to see his heart. What a paradigm shift. Only when I can grasp the heart of Jesus Christ for me in the midst of my sin will I be willing to boldly and confidently enter that throne of grace. And from, friends, there's a, another wonderful treasure that shouts to us from this passage. We have focused thus far on the sympathy of Jesus and how we can feel what we feel. But I want you to see something else. That Jesus offers to us something more than just sympathy. Something more than just feeling what we feel. It says that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We need not just sympathy. We need help. Do you receive an awful diagnosis? Maybe what you, maybe, you know, you want sympathy. You want sympathy. You want someone to walk alongside you. But man, you need a doctor. You need someone to start some course of treatment. And that's what this passage is saying. That Jesus offers to us not only sympathy, but help. That's what we have in Jesus. Not just one who's able to sympathize with us, but one who can help us. 
Do you need help this morning? Do you need help this morning? May I call you to look to Jesus, the one who has been tempted in every way yet without sin. The Apostle Paul, in reflecting on this similar topic, takes it a step further. He says, not only has Jesus been tempted in every way without sin, he says that actually there's a sense in which Jesus became sin for us on the cross so that we might become the righteousness of God. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 21. That Jesus is all able to offer us help because he became sin and that was nailed in his body to the cross. And he can therefore offer us real help. Do you need help? Do you need help? I'll return again to the statement that I began the sermon with this morning. In order for us to draw near with confidence before that throne of grace, we need to behold with our heart of hearts the heart of Jesus. Will you behold him? Can I invite you this morning to receive the warm embrace of Jesus, not holding his nose, not looking away, but running to you. That's what this passage declares to us. That's what we need, church. Let's pray. We thank you, Jesus, for the power of the proclaimed word of God. We thank you for the truths that are presented uh, in this passage. We thank you, Jesus, for your heart, that even in these very moments of our sin and our weakness, then when all we want to do is run away, we thank you that we can see in you one who runs to us with open arms, not minimizing sin in any way because we know that you would go and die on the cross for our sin. Lord, I pray for my, uh, my brothers and sisters here uh, who, are, who are maybe not fully convinced in, in their heart of the goodness of your heart, of the overflow of the goodness of, of you towards us, even in the midst of our weakness, even in the midst of our ignorance and waywardness. Would you, by your spirit, convince us of that? Let us receive this in our heart. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.